Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe to the RSS feed, and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. The price only $197. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. It's my pleasure to welcome Rob Welch. He is probably the oldest podcaster, actually not old in age, but podcasting longer than anybody else. And he is a VP of Podcaster Relations with Libsyn and Wizard Media, and formerly with Podcast 411 and co-author of a book, Tricks of the Podcasting Masters. So we're going to learn a lot with Rob today, and he's coming to us from Overland Park, Kansas. Rob, how are you? Great. Jason, thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. So you've been podcasting since the old, old days when we used to podcast with a couple cans and a piece of string, I guess, back in 2004, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been podcasting since 2004. I wasn't one of the first, I wasn't the first or a couple handful or so people before me, but, and that are the few you know, out there that are still podcasting. I've been doing it a little bit longer, but, but talking about months difference in time. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really amazing. What an amazing medium. What an amazing way to reach people. And, you know, I guess maybe, can you just tell us about your a little bit of your background? And I want to talk about Libsyn and just a whole bunch of your ideas that people can use to be better at podcasting. Sure. I got into podcasting back in, like I said, 2004. There was a little article up in uh, Engadget. I think it was like beginning of October of 2004. And it said, hey, if you want to podcast, all you have to do is add this enclosure tag to your RSS feed and you're good to go. And I went, what's an enclosure tag and what's an RSS feed? And I go, well, obviously there's got to be a site around to help on this. And I looked around and there was nobody helping at that time. So I said, well, I'm going to do a site, and I'm going to do a podcast on it. I, and I always wanted to kind of be in radio. So I thought, well, what do I want to podcast about? I go, well, I'll do a podcast where I interview podcasters. And there's like 100 of them maybe now. Uh, that'll give me some content to work with. And so that was my first podcast, Podcast 411, which is about interviewing other podcasters. And it was my way to learn from those that were doing it and, and to share what I was learning with others that were looking to do it. I really tried to make that as much as a community show as I possibly could and uh, didn't take advertising. I tried to keep it as you know, neutral as possible and, and, and just it just took off. People, it became the go-to place to get interviewed and I got lucky and I had some really big name guests. I've had Larry Kudlow from Kudlow & Company on. I've had um, Senator John Edwards came on uh, who I then became a consultant for. I had uh, Leo Laporte's been on and I had App Curry on and I've had, you know, Pretty much all the big names in the early days of podcasting came on the show. Fantastic. And what did you attribute getting those big name guests to? I mean, Cudlow obviously is a huge name. How, how did you get them? Banged on as many doors as I possibly could. I would just, you know, initially the first few interviews, I just went out and I just I blasted out like to 10 people. When I, when I said, oh, I'm going to launch a show, I blasted out to 10 people that were doing a podcast. I said, would you want to come on the show? Six of them replied back right away, um, and you know, five of them said, yeah, I'll do it. And I, and I assume and, some said, what's a podcast, right? <laughs> well, no, they were podcasters, so I was interviewing podcasters. So but I said, but hey, Cud I'm doing Cudlow? A pod Cudlow was a podcaster? 
Pod Cudlow had a podcast, yeah. Way back then, I am, yeah, I even had I Walt Mossberg. Walt Mossberg wow. had a podcast. I had Walt on the show. I had um, Battlestar Galactica had a podcast, and, and I had Ronald Moore on the show. Um, for those that like the show Eureka, I had uh, the the uh, sheriff on the show. But yeah, I, you know, early on there was a, some celebrities, um, pseudo celebrities that were doing podcasting, and uh, I was able to get some of them. And it, a lot of it was just by you know just going to IMDb Pro uh, and and looking through for the the uh, PR contacts. Uh, others was just going into the RSS feed and finding who is the person managing the feed and contacting them that way. Well, so how many different podcast shows do you produce? Then you have an iOS show. So Podcast for One was the first one. Um, then I was also part of another show called Today in Podcasting, which is uh, myself and Gary Leland and Paul Culligan and Dave Jackson, and we just kind of insiders talking about podcasting. So those two are a podcasting. And then the other one that really took off and where my big audience is uh, was five years ago before when the iPhone was announced. Um, I said, I got to get an iPhone. I go, well, I, I need to do a show about the iPhone. No one else is. So I launched the first podcast about the iPhone, and in in a matter of months, that show had a larger audience than I was able to build with my podcast four on one audience over a couple of years. So here I am doing almost nothing on the promotion side, just because it's in iTunes. People search for iPhone or iPad. To this day, when you search for iPhone or iPad, my show will come up as the first or second result. That's fantastic. And do you want to talk about some of your stats with your different shows and, and what your subscriber listener base is, downloads? And then I'd also like to talk about something we mentioned when we were off air that was about how people sort of play with their stats or lie about their stats. And maybe what is the sort of credible source to get statistics on podcasters? If you're an advertiser, say, for example, that's Lip a really yeah. important thing. Yeah. Libsyn is 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 the you know a de facto standard for stats for podcasting. Uh, Libsyn has been around L I B S Y N. Libsyn's been around since the beginning of podcasting. Their stats are what people trust. And and if we actually look at the Libsyn stats and you compare it to the FeedBurner download stats or the PodTrack stats or the Blueberry stats, what you find is all four of them roughly run within about five percent of each other. But you know, Libsyn stats are, are really, if you're hosting at Libsyn, that's all you really need for your de- your de facto stats. Right now, now, but you can't get stats on other podcasters who aren't posting at Libsyn, can you? Or no, no. Yeah. In, in matter of fact, one of the main reasons a lot of people host with Libsyn is to get good stats. Uh, the problem is, if you're hosting at Amazon S3 or places like that that aren't designed for podcasting, the stats are very unreliable. I'll see people that will come in from other hosting sites that aren't designed for podcasts. And they come in and they'll go, my stats are one-third or one-fourth of what I thought they were. I'm like, yeah, that's because they're not filtering. They're not looking at what a real download is. They're looking at the same request multiple times and counting it as multiple downloads. So people's stats tend to be overinflated when they come to us. Uh, there was an, another podcast host out there that was notorious for that. And we had people come over, their, their stats were like one-eighth of what they really were. And, and that hurts when you actually are giving out inflated stats to advertisers. That hurts. Um, your chances of getting back because the advertisers work on an ROI basis and they're looking, okay, I'm going to pay the CPM is what I'm paying other people and I paid you that and I'm getting one-eighth the return on the results as, as what I'm getting on these other guys. So, you know, it is important to host some place that you can trust their stats and give good stats to advertisers. And the other thing is you can't really believe what people tell you out there on stats uh, without seeing them. I, you know, I was a big proponent, always have been, being very public with my stats. So I'd send people screenshots anytime they want to see my stats. Um, I did this on the Podcast 401 days because I knew how hard it was to work to get to where I was. Eventually, you know, Podcast 401, I eventually got up to about 4,500, 5,000 downloads an episode. And I worked hard to get to that point. And I was getting people that were emailing me going, I've been doing this podcasting thing for, you know, two months now, and I'm only at 1,000 downloads an episode. What am I doing wrong? And I'd be like, what? You're doing this two months. You got a thousand dollars. That's fantastic. They I'm should like, be ecstatic. You did. You know, yeah. you're doing something right. And right. Like, well, other people are telling me, you know, they got twenty or thirty or forty thousand dollars an episode. Like, ah, they're lying. And, and I remember when I started at Libsyn, there was this example. I won't say who it is. I can't. But this one person was out there saying, "I get sixty thousand downloads an episode. I get sixty thousand downloads an episode." You know, he's out there saying it over and over. And I'm like, "There's no way this guy's show is getting sixty thousand. I'm a pretty good judge of content." You know, maybe not perfect, but I know that this content does not even come close to garnering that. First day on the job at Libsyn, I went to his stats and checked them out. <laughs> I was uh, like, hey, yeah. I can see what your stats are. And I went, 
he was getting 600 downloads an episode. So he was just blatantly lying or did he somehow blatantly manipulate lying. the numbers? Blatantly to- lying. There was no way to misrepresent that. There was no if, ands, or buts about it. And, I was like, and it's, it was things like that that really irked me because people that were trying in earnest and you know, getting to 1,000. And, and I always tell people is if you get over 250 downloads an episode, you've broken away from your family and friends. You're becoming successful. You get over 500 and now you're more successful than most podcasts. If you get over 1,000, you're doing something very good. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. Well, let, let's kind of dig into that stats issue a little bit more. What are some of the largest podcasts out there that are big, commercial, corporate type of podcasts? NPR comes to mind. Adam Carolla comes to mind. Adam Carolla is, is you know, the Guinness World Record holder. So he, he's one of the biggest ones. Joe Rogan is one of the biggest ones. Um, Mark Marin is one of the biggest ones. Uh, and, and when you're one of the biggest, podcasts. though, what kind of numbers are you getting when you're you're huge. talking you're talking a couple hundred thousand and more per episode you're, you're measuring in hundreds of thousands per episode okay all right and so if they're doing an episode once a week or you know once a day i mean that that, that is a lot of traffic that's a yeah. lot of impressions yeah. adam Kroll is doing multiple millions of downloads a, a week because he's doing five episodes a week and he's got his back and some back catalog too. So I mean, it's not just when when you get downloads in a, in a given week, you're going to get downloads from previous episodes as well. Right, right, absolutely. Do you have a recommendation, by the way, for podcasters as to should they leave their old episodes up just forever? Should they take them down? I suppose it depends on their back end business model. If they want to put those as part of a membership site, maybe leave a few dozen old episodes up, but take some of the archives and put them as a like a premium content or something. Any thoughts about that? Mark Marin is making a lot of money right now from his premium episodes. What he's always done is said, I'm going to make my last 50 episodes available for free. And anything beyond that comes off the feed. So now what he does is you, you sign up, subscription, you know, go to wtfpod.libson.com, and, and you can see his 50 most recent episodes, and you can see all the other ones, but you can't play the old ones. And then he also has them in his smartphone app. So you can see all the episodes, but you can only play the last 50. But then you sign up for a My Libson subscription with him, And that allows you to have access, like with Netflix, you have access to the entire back catalog for the period of time you sign up. So my my recommendation when I say to anyone is, look, if you're trying to monetize your podcast through the content, you don't do it with advertising alone. You don't do it with premium alone. You've got to combine the two. You have to have a a premium option and membership option, and you also have to have an advertising option. And so you monetize with advertising through the most recent episodes. You monetize through premium content, the back catalog. And if you're lucky, you're going to get 2 to 3 maybe 4%. A market's a little bit more net of your audience that will actually sign up for the premium. And, and how do you recommend doing premium content? I mean, you mentioned having an app. Should a podcaster have their own app to do it? Or what is the simple way to – I mean, iTunes won't help you out. I know that. Right. Well, that, that, that's the big issue there is I really can't do it through iTunes. iTunes doesn't allow you to sell anything. So you have to look at how is your – audience is going to consume this content. If it's audio, having that app to stream those episodes through the app is a, is a great way to do it. You know, you also have to look at what kind of content you're going to make. Is it going to be back catalog? If your content's a news show where you're giving the latest news, your back catalog isn't all that valuable. I've done the iPhone podcast for five years. I don't know if my episodes from five years ago are worth selling that content. So I actually have a different type of premium model where I do new tips and tricks that I just do as blog posts as a separate way to to monetize a premium audience. But I leave all the episodes available for free. So you have to look at what your content is. Like a comedian like Mark Marin, an episode that was done two years ago, three years ago, is just as funny today as it was two or three years ago. Maybe be more funny today. Yeah, the only the only distinction on even a comedian though is if they're really current event oriented, it might sort of get out of date too, like technology. But but not that bad. Certainly, you're right. So that makes a lot of sense. If it's a news and current events podcast, old news is just that it's old news, so it may not be that valuable from a from a, a sales standpoint. I don't know if anyone would be interested in buying old New York Times or Wall Street Journal podcast episodes. So, so very good point there. But, but how should they do it? What is the mechanical methodology for the, the best one for uh, selling back catalog? Episodes? There's a lot of well, there's a lot of different services. Libsyn now offers a service service where we make your back catalog available for you to make it premium. So we can lock down your back 
uh, catalog episodes. They can't be downloaded. The only way people can access them or listen to them or, or view them because it works for audio or video is if they're a subscriber. And then we handle everything for you. We handle the, the uh, back end for the, the technical side of it and the support side and also the billing side of it. And then we just do a rev share split with you so it, there's no upfront costs. We handle it all for you in the background. And you can go to Libsyn.com forward slash mylibsyn to see a little bit about how that works. Initially, we set up a web page for you where you people access the premium content. Once you get to 100 active subscribers, then we'll do a smartphone app for you as well. And then you can have a standalone smartphone app on the iOS side or the Android side. And then that, that's the additional way for your audience to access the content so they can listen or watch while they're at work on their computer. They can then go over with the same login, get it on their iOS device or on their Android device. So it's one login, access on all the different devices that most people are going to have access to. Fantastic. That's a great service, Rob. Podcasters have just been hankering for that kind of thing. So, Rob, when they use that that premium service as a way to sell their back catalog, their old episodes, their their other content, I, I mean, how much are they selling them for? Is it ninety nine cents as the episode, kind of the iTunes concept? It's, or? it's 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 more of a Netflix model that we're doing. So it's a subscription model, which is a better model. Um, and let me tell you why. It's a recurring subscription. So just like Netflix and Hulu, you sign up once and you keep getting billed over and over. So your end users sign up once and they get billed over and over until they go in and, and manually cancel it. So that is always a better way to do a, a, a revenue generation model where you get a, a guaranteed revenue stream coming in. And so Mark does it one ninety nine a month, um, four ninety nine for six months, at seven ninety nine for twelve months. I believe is his price points. I think Adam Adam Kroll is doing the same thing now. He just launched his premium last week. He's doing the same price points, you know. And again, it's monthly fee, a little bit less for six months, a little bit less per month if you do twelve month. Yeah, and I just want to make sure the listeners understand what you're saying. You're saying it's a dollar ninety nine per month yes. or seven dollars and ninety nine cents per year. So those are shows where they have large subscriber bases because by the time you do a rev share on that, podcasters not gonna make any money unless they have a pretty big base, right? You'll be surprised. I mean, you you only need, you know, about a thousand listeners and you get a good percentage you know, it the way it actually works out is the more niche your topic is, the higher the percentage of your audience that's gonna sign up for it. So, I mean, it really comes down to the content. And the other thing is you have to give the, the listener something of value. I mean, it has to be something that they want to pay. Now, some of them are going to buy. Some of your core audience, no matter what, 1% or 2% of your audience, you just say you're doing premium, they're going to pay you no matter what you put out there. And they, they, don't, they may not even check for the premium stuff. They're just, okay, I'm going to do this. This is my way to say thank you. But if you really want to build your audience up, you want to get past that 2% mark, you have to offer them something of value. So like Mark Maron will offer a special bonus only episode that only people can get if they're premium subscribers. And he'll do that once every you know, four, six, or eight weeks, or somewhere around that time frame. He'll put out just a special bonus only episode. Uh, and I recommend that. I mean, I, I think that if you're going to do the premium, you really should do every now and then something special. If you go to a trade show, maybe a couple interviews you did that no one else, uh, your regular audience doesn't get access to. And just meant, and it's it's a way to drive more sales because you mentioned that premium in your episode and say, oh well, you didn't get it. You know, you might want to check this out. It's only for premium people, or or hey, premium audience, you might have noticed I just put this up or something like that. And, and so uh, just a couple questions in terms of the user experience with that premium content. Does the user have to go to Libsyn to subscribe? They, they have to go to Libsyn. You have to go to a website, to, the, the My Libsyn website. You know, we set up a, a premium page for each of the producers. So you go to that premium page for that website. Usually uh, the producer will have a link from his regular website to that. And then from there, they sign up for an account, username. Uh, you know, they put in their username and password they want. And then after they put that in, then they go ahead and sign up for a subscription. And then they can use that same username and password for subscriptions for other shows. So you may use that same username and password for a subscription to Mark Marin and, and that username and password also for um, Adam Carolla stuff. And but each, but each, subscription, each subscription for the user is individual, though. There's no Correct. Libsyn subscription where I get it all, right? Right. Okay. Nope. Okay. Nope. Yeah. It's, it's, and that's that's how you do the rev share with the po individual podcasters, of course. Correct. So here's the big question, because this is something I and every other podcaster would love. Rob, does Libsyn share the 
the subscriber information with the podcaster because gosh, I would love to have, I would love to know who is listening to me and I'd love to have their email addresses too. And many of them, you know, we do things to try and get them to opt in offering free bonuses and things like that. And they do opt in and that works, but it it would just be so great if you could know everybody that was listening to you. Amazon.com, you know, when I sell my books on Amazon, they don't, I don't know who buys them. Unfortunately, I wish I did. What does Libsyn do there? Our goal is to have that available to you in the future. We could pull it for you manually now if you needed it. But it, yeah, it's uh, it's not in the interface, but we're, we're redoing some of the UI, and hopefully that'll be in the, the quote, Libsyn 4 UI. But if you needed that, get that subscriber list, we could pull that for you. Fantastic. Okay, good. We'll be back in just a minute. Here's your chance to catch up on all of those Creating Wealth shows that you've missed. There's a three-book set with shows 1 through 60, all digital download. You save $94 by buying this three-book set. Go ahead and get these advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. Well, what other things do you want people to know? I mean, with Podcast 411 and your book, Tricks Tricks of the Podcasting Masters, what should people do? What are the best practices in podcasting? Well, one thing I know you've mentioned on your show is that is what you do, and that's edit. I think that's so many people think they can just hit play, you know, record and stop and then post it and, and not care about what happens in the middle. And they have bad dead air pauses. They have a background noise. The worst one I ever heard was someone wanting me to interview them back in the day when Podcast 101 was in its peak. And I was getting five, ten requests a day for people to be interviewed. And I remember listening to this one, and there's a kid, and he's like, and you hear, you hear a knock at the door. And he goes, hold on, I'll be right back. Right. And you hear him walk away. <laughs> yeah. And you hear him talking to someone in the background. Amazing. And I'm sitting there going, really? You couldn't edit that out. And, and then, you know, about five minutes later, he comes back and he goes okay i'm back unbelievable and that's didn't just funny. think there was anything wrong with that and i'm like really okay that's you're incredible. not coming on my show yeah i'm yeah, not gonna send my listeners to listen to you so i mean have a little bit of consideration for your audience if you can take out dead air and clean up a little bit take a 22 minute show down to 18 minutes you've just saved your listener four minutes of their life yeah and and the other thing is sound quality you know which i know goes with editing so it's part of your same tip but i just cannot stand some of the shows with such bad sound quality that i'm listening to you know where either the host is squeaky and whiny or like you said background noise or just amazing or or if there's an interview type format they're at totally different volume levels i mean if they would edit and mix the sound together and make it mono rather than stereo my god it's just courteous to your listener, for God's sake. Yeah, if you go to podcast411.com forward slash mixer.pdf, that's the setup I use for Podcast 411. And it shows you how to record a Skype interview. And, and I always recommend you record in stereo and you put one person on one channel and another on the other channel. Oh, yeah, in the beginning, and, but then you mix right, it to mono, right? Right, then you mix it and, and they use a program called Levelator. You know, if you got two people talking, use level later. It brings them both to the same levels. It takes out all the pops and the peaks and gets everybody at the right level. So it's a free program. Level later works Mac, PC, Linux. You know, the guys from the Conversation Network, Doug Kay and Michael Hagen, those guys, they brought that program on board to podcasters a long time ago. And it's amazing how many don't use it at this date. And it, I can't understand why not. Great tip. Great tip. What other tips of the podcasting masters? I wrote that with Merle Lafferty. We wrote that back in 2000, uh, to the late 2005, early 2006. We got it published out in 2006. And, and a lot of the stuff we had in there, we tried to make it would be timeless. And we talked to a lot of different podcasters. And, you know, some of the stuff, consistency is, is one of the big things. Be consistent in your sound levels like we just talked. Be consistent in your release schedule. Um, be consistent in the type of content you release. If your podcast is on a certain subject, don't go all of a sudden, you know, you've got an iPhone podcast and one day you start talking about Battlestar Galactica for three quarters of the show. You know what? A good percentage of your audience might actually like that. The other part that doesn't, they're going to tune you out and not come back. So stay on message. Another part of that is involve your audience. I think one thing that podcasters, oftentimes I'll hear different shows that don't do is don't bring in enough audience feedback and listener feedback and do everything you can to initiate that feedback from listeners. If you build every listener you bring into your show is is someone that's going to be an advocate for your show. They're going to go out and they're going to say, hey, listen to this show, especially if they're on it multiple times. My iPhone show, I've, I've done 
I think, a really great job of bringing an audience. I have more listener feedback than I can ever use. I, almost a thousand pieces of listener feedback I've never been able to put on the show. And from that, I see all the time people tweeting, hey, go check out this show, go check out that show. I see links coming in from the different websites from people that I, I mention or I play their feedback on my show. So make sure you have a good call-in number. Uh, use Gmail. Make sure they are able to record and send you in the feedback. Um, and then make sure you edit the feedback and listen to it before you put it in your show. You know, if someone – I had one guy who was literally every night for like two or three weeks in a row sending me in 15 to 20-minute voicemail messages. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so you, you know where – to use listener feedback and where not to use listener right. feedback. Just because they left you a, uh, a voicemail on your listener call in line doesn't mean you need to play it, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you have some fun with it, too. I mean, I had one where I was playing this clip where the, the per sometimes you're going to get some negative feedback. You know, I, I had this one where I played throughout an episode where I was like, hello, Rob, hello, Rob, and I just kept playing that little clip all the way through, and people were probably like, what is that, what is that? And the very end of the episode, I played his full feedback at the end, and he was just, like, belligerent. And then so people knew it was my little way of tweaking at this guy and that kind of got him to go away for a little bit so you know have some fun with some of the feedback but you know don't be mean well just just curious though on on feedback because you glossed over that pretty quickly so a listener call in line where they can leave voicemails are you recommending google voice for that you said gmail so um gmail for them to you know record it on their device and email it into you um but actually what i I use K7.net. I've used K7.net for a long time. I know some uh, people use Google Voice. I, I personally like K7.net, and it's just six of this, half a dozen of the other. Uh, I've used my number for uh, Podcast for One is still active. It's 206 Mom Help. So 206 Mom Help. And then the one for today an iPhone is 206 Moon Dog. So it's 206 666 6364. Moon Dog has nothing to do with the show. It just happened to be right before K7.net got rid of their ability for you to do custom numbers, I happened to pick that for a tutorial I was working on. And I was using it as an example, let's say you had a dog show, but it was a good number to easy one to remember. And just make sure you mention it all the time. Put the phone number, if you have a call in number, put it in the title of the episode. So when people are looking at it on a device, it scrolls through the top and they can see it. Put it in the lyrics tag, in the ID3 tags. Mention it at the beginning of the show, mention it in the middle of the show, or mention it right after you play other people's voicemail, and mention it at the end of the show. You know, you, you, you have to mention it over and over if you really want people to remember because people just, the, just the things go in and out of their head real quick. Yeah, sure, sure they do. In terms of podcasting, we've been talking really about audio podcasting. What about video? You know, video has its place, and, and there's some really good video podcasts out there that the, the reason that I think when most people now talk podcasting, you know, and Apple doesn't differentiate. They have audio and video. But I think what happened is video has become so dominated by YouTube that it, it's become YouTube first, podcast second if you're doing video. Um, and even people like Revision 3 will tell you they're getting most of their revenue generated from YouTube, not from their RSS feed anymore. On the audio side, it's still iTunes. iTunes is still the dominant force. You're still going to get the majority of your listens from your RSS feed. It's still going to be after the fact. You know, Don't get caught in this mindset. I have to have a live show. Even Leo Laporte will tell you that he generates all his revenue and all his downloads and all his listens are really from the, the download after the fact, not from his live show. So, you know... It, so my opinion on this is, you know, video is nice. If you want to do a mix feed where you have audio and video, that's great. But if you've got some sort of business-oriented content, I think you still need to be audio first. I, I like audio the best. I do them both uh, among my 15 different shows. I, I have two that are in video version. And it's just so much harder to produce video. I, I think if, if someone has a business purpose where they need to do video, then yes, do video. Uh, I, I mean... An example that comes to mind would be something like yoga instructor or medi spa, an esthetician or something, you know, where you need to show people things. Then video, that makes sense. But if you don't need video, audio is so portable. It's so easy to produce. It's so quick. It's just a great medium. I love audio. Right. I always say when I go out and I do a lot of speaking on podcasting and, and people ask me about audio video, I'll say, remember this, especially for business. I go, business travelers have a lot more time to consume audio than they do video. When they're driving their car, when they're working out, I mean, they have precious little time in their life. And, and, and audio can fill that few spots they have open. 
uh, people, we see it in our stats. Our stats go up. The biggest amount of time, the, the downloads we get, the most downloads at Lipson occur between Tuesday and Thursday business hours. Those are the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, traditionally during U.S. business hours are when we see our most downloads. That's not when we see our most uploads. So our uploads are mostly on the weekend. So it's not like people are saying, well, okay, that's just because when people are uploading. No, that's when people are consuming. And, and why are they consuming at that point in time? They're at work. And what are they doing at work? They're listening to podcasts. At work. That's at interesting. Work. Yeah, that's Absolutely. Interesting. I mean, we have a lot of comedian podcasts, so people are listening to this, that, that kind of content at work. And, and we, we hear from a lot of people, you know, they listen at work and, and, and they'll have issues. Okay, you know, is it, why can't I listen here or there? Or something's wrong with the episode. And you, you know they're at work. They'll mention it or you see it from their email. But, yeah, I, we still feel... Audio, if you, if there's not a good driving reason, audio should be your first step out. There's a lot more ways to monetize with audio. Now, video, again, you're going to have to be shorter episodes and you have to be, remember, you're going to be competing on YouTube and, and your content there on YouTube is facing up against people getting hit in the crotch with skateboards and that stuff sells. <laughs> I mean, that's. Just, or dogs riding skateboards. Yeah, I mean. Or, or Charlie bit my finger, or you know the history of dance. You know that's what you're competing against there. So YouTube is more of a stumble upon technology, quick entertainment, empty calories, and, and podcasting is more of a meal. It's a and, meal, and it's a subscriber and a relationship. And here's something I should, you know, people go, why should I even podcast? Why don't I just blog? You know, people can just get the blog. Okay, I say, what is there? Over 30 million active blogs. There's less than 150,000 active podcasts. Yeah, podcasting is much better than blogging. And podcasting is blogging. It's just an audio blog. That's all it is. So yeah, very good point. Now, just to touch on one more thing there, mixed feeds. I personally, at least as a consumer, I don't I don't like mixed feeds. I don't like video and audio in the same feed. The two shows that I produce, I produce a video and an audio version of those shows. And, and the rest of them are all audio. And really, I like audio much better, as I mentioned. But do you, do you think podcasters should mix their feed with both in one feed or they should do separate feeds? If you're doing the same content, audio and video, then have separate feeds. I'm not a real big fan of having two feeds in iTunes because the way iTunes rankings works, you're better with one feed, which you, know, you want to have as few feeds as possible. I know some video people have like three feeds. They have an HD feed. They'll have a um, yeah, 1080p feed. Dilute. They have 720p yeah, not good. feed. And, and, and I say, Mm. The way iTunes works, if you really want to be ranked in iTunes, you have to have one feed. Consolidate. Yep, because it, it, they're going to look at how many number of subscribers. If you ever want to know how iTunes rankings works, here, I'll let people know how it works. It's based on the – if you see those top 100 lists, the top 100 lists are based on the number of new subscribers in the last seven days with the weighted average for the last 24, 48, and 72 hours. So the more new subscribers you get – that the last 24 hours has more bearing than you did 48 hours and then 72 and so forth and teeters down. But it's all based on the last week of new, for new subscribers, those top 100 lists. Then there's the search results. The search results are based on ranking through shows that have similar hits on keywords that you're searching for. And then they rank them based on the total number of subscribers you've ever had and also based on your reviews. And, and then the reviews and the total number of subscribers also help you in the featured sections of your subcategory. So it's really important to have people subscribe to your show in iTunes and don't use the ITPC feature. There's that ITPC link that people will put on their site where you click on it and it automatically subscribes you in iTunes. Well, it automatically subscribes you in iTunes on that person's computer iTunes store never sees that subscription, so it never helps you. Very interesting point. Very good point. Speaking about mixed feeds, there's one more little funny thing that I've seen other podcasters do, and I wanted to do it myself, but neither I or my tech team could figure out how to do it, is I've seen people put documents in a feed, like PDF files in a feed. Uh, how do you do that? You know, I think that would be really nice for my listeners if I could just push PDF documents out to them that I'm talking about something on the show. Maybe it's something that really lends itself to a printed or at least a something you can read on a screen type of thing. Do you recommend that? And if so, yeah, how I do mean, you do it? There's some, there's some really good podcasts that do that. Um, you know, ones that will do that oftentimes will be some of the language podcasts. So they'll put the PDF out in the feed um, that will have you know, some of the language lessons that they talked about for that episode. And our system supports that. As far as our, our system is concerned, we're RSS2 compliant, and you can put up and it be an audio file, a video file with us, 
even an image or a PDF document can be your, your file for an episode. And then you just release it as an episode and it goes into the feed. Now, we also support PDF documents and, and image documents as extras, episode extras for the, for the uh, smartphone apps we do. So we also help people that, okay, I want to have this, but only people that have the smartphone app can get these PDF documents. So we do that as well. Very interesting. And see, I, I saw that in iTunes, but how do you get the PDF off of there? I, I couldn't even figure it out. Well, in, in, in iTunes, if you subscribe, uh, it'll go right in. The PDF will actually go right into iTunes, and you can open it up. Just click on it. In iTunes, it'll open up, and you can view it that way. If you have a smartphone app and you get it in on your smartphone app, uh, you can open it up and uh, have it open up in iBooks, and you can actually even have it move over to be in your iBooks library. Fantastic. For, for people doing a show, one, one th- well, other, other type of show that lends itself really well to video is cooking, for example. You know, if you're doing a cooking show, you can put the recipes in there as a document. If you're doing a legal show, you could put legal documents, you know, support materials in there. That's just a great thing. RSS, what, a, what an awesome world we, we're, we're in with a world of podcasting. It's just, just great. Any other tips you'd like to give on Masters of Podcasting? Yeah, one one thing I was just mentioned. If you're going to do this, where you have one episode is your you know the video, and the next is your PDF or the audio, and then your PDF. Release the PDF first, the audio second. Ah, oh, good. The point. way iTunes works is it will download the most recent item the next time it checks. So if iTunes, if you release them, a lot of time what people do that make mistakes when they do PDFs is they release the PDF and the audio file back to back. And, or they released, or even worse, they released two audio files back to back within you know, 20 minutes of each other. They'll have two episodes, part one, part two. And if you look at your downloads for the one that went on the feed last, it'll be four or five times greater than the one that went up right before it because iTunes will check your feed. And when it checks your feed, it only downloads the most recent item. It doesn't da- it'll download two or three items if there's two or three new items. It downloads just the most recent one. Is there an optimal spacing then for episodes? I tell people keep them a day apart. You know, you don't, you don't want to be doing. I, I see this, and I still see this, and I recommend people, and I'll send them email. Don't do this, but I'll see them. They'll release uh, on an irregular basis to make matters worse. But they'll release okay on on a Monday. They release one episode, then they don't release another episode till a week from then on Wednesday, and then they release the next episode two, you know, twenty thirty minutes later. Then they don't go another couple of weeks for another episode. So what happens to them? What happens is they get really distra- you know, it, you look at how many downloads they're getting per episode and it varies. If they've released episodes two or three days apart versus they released them a week apart versus they released them two weeks apart, the numbers down, download per episode just are all over the place. And, and especially if they release them back to back, again, you might see a four to one, three to one ratio between the download numbers. And especially if you're doing advertising on your podcast. You definitely don't want to be doing back to back because you're hurting how many downloads you get. You know, if you're going to have two episodes, put them a couple of days apart. I know a gun podcast that releases three episodes every time they do it, and they always release them the same evening, and they always release them right apart. And you can always, you know, look at their stats. You can tell which ones episode one, two, and three just looking at their stats. Yeah, yeah, not not a good practice. Not a good practice. You, you'll be at Blog World probably. I'll, I'll be there. I, in New York. I'll be at Blog World. I'm speaking on a couple of sessions. One is about interviewing. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm going to be doing with my co-author, uh, Merle Lafferty. We're going to do the 411 on interviewing, how to do interviews and give some tips and tricks there. Um, and then the second day I'm going to be running a panel session on, uh, how to monetize your podcast. So we talk about all the different ways you can make money from podcasting, be it CPM advertising, CPA advertising with premium, with smartphone apps, with donations, with getting a network created, just all the different ways selling swag. Different things you can do, some tips there. Um, I Paul Culligan's going to be on that panel. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Ken Plume, who is the producer of the Smodcast Network, and uh, Hemda from Keith and the Girl. So uh, a good group of people that have been working with monetizing podcasts for a long time. Um, and then I think I'm also on a panel with uh, Rob Greenlee, and we're going to talk about the future of podcasting. Fantastic. As a medium. Yeah, very exciting, very exciting stuff. Any other trade shows that you'd recommend podcasters attend besides Blog World? Yeah, I just was at NAB, but that's you know that's really a more of a high end professional broadcaster. Yeah, right? yeah, that's that's a professional broadcaster side. You know, I was, but hey, they let me in there as press, so that was nice. The problem is, you know, where I call problem if you're Rick and you're running Blog World, but it really is the only national convention that they're going to have. Now, the next one they're going to do after New York is going to be Las Vegas, and that's going to be in January, and it's going to be a couple days leading up before CES. 
So they're they're hoping to you know ride the coattails of CES or the pre-tails. That, the, that'll be another blog world. Yes, the next blog world after New York uh, in June is going to be uh, blog world. They're going to change the name, but that'll be uh, in January. I think. Uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th of January 2013, leading up uh, where CES kicks off on January 8th. So it's gonna, they're going to kind of overlap that one day there. They, they're going to have it at the Rio in, uh, in, El, in Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. Yeah, fantastic. Good stuff. Rob, give out your websites, if you would, and tell people where they can learn more. Okay, if you want to learn more about podcasting, you can go to podcast411.com, and that, that's my t- site there. And there's a tutorial that takes you step-by-step step through how to podcast of course, if you want to podcast or you're already podcasting, you want to make money podcasting, go to Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. That stands for Liberated Syndication. And, uh, you know, especially if you're having an issue with, with your podcast host or if you just want to get real good stats, Libsyn's a great way to do it. We can import all your content over, get help you monetize. And then uh, if you want to learn about more about the iPhone, you can check out my podcast today in iOS at todayios.com. I've been doing that for five years now. Fantastic. Well, Rob Walsh, thank you so much for joining us today and for all the pearls of wisdom. Learned a lot of great stuff from you. Appreciate it. Jason, thanks for having me on. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.